let's uh, turn to the book of Revelation. And this evening, what I want to do is provide an overview for chapters 4 and 5. And then next time we're together, we'll begin uh, an exposition of 4 and then move into chapter 5 after that. Let's uh, pray first for the preaching, for the hearing of the word, and then we will get right into this evening's study. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again, Lord, for gathering us together. We thank you for all of the work that you've given us to do, Lord, in Haiti, in Guatemala, the work here, and the things that even now we don't anticipate, Lord. We thank you uh, that you have counted us uh, worthy in Christ Jesus to serve you in this way. And we ask, Lord, as we study uh, uh, Revelation chapters uh, 4 and 5 in particular and the, and the whole book uh, moving forward, that you would give us a, a grand perspective, your perspective upon history. Help us, Lord, not only to know these things, that are in, know the things that are in this book, but to live in light of them. In Christ's name I pray, amen. As uh, Pastor Mark has been introducing the book of Revelation, uh, he, he's done a good job sort of outlining various things and laying out structures for the book. But as you read the book of Revelation, I know that it still can be kind of confusing because of all of the imagery and all of the symbolism that is in the book. So what I want to do first is provide an, an overview, an outline of chapters 4 and 5. It's a very basic outline of chapters 4 and 5. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 actually all go together. They're, they're sort of one piece. But we'll focus on chapters 4 and 5. And then what I would like to do is go to the Old Testament and take a look, read some texts that provide the Old Testament background for Revelation chapters 4 and 5. So then when we're doing the exposition and we make reference to those texts, we won't have to take the time to go back and read all of them again. So, um, let's begin with um, reading the text. I want to read 4 and 5 together in your hearing. So, Revelation chapter 4. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I saw in the Spirit, and behold, the throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone, jasper stone, and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were twenty-four thrones. And upon the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. And the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had a face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. 
And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crown before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. When he had taken the book, The four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne. And the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth And on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Amen. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the preaching of his word. So, th- this is just a marvelous, right? Like, this, this, is, um, this is what the people of God long for. To enter into the presence of God. When, when, when a believer dies now, we enter into this place and... There we we stand with this great company and worship God. One day that worship will be on a new heavens and a new earth with resurrection bodies. But until then, until the day of the Lord, until the coming of the Lord, if a believer dies, this is where they enter. And, And Paul said that he longed to be here. Right? So this is a very, um, a very glorious and wonderful picture. And if you've read your Old Testament, as we were reading these two chapters, again, chapter 6 is connected very tightly because chapter 6 then is the opening of the seals. There's a description of the opening of the seven seals in chapter 6. 
But if you've read your Old Testament, you, you've heard a lot of things here that you maybe have heard throughout the Old Testament. And w- what I want to do then is provide that Old Testament context. Um, so we're going to read a lot of the Bible. And I personally enjoy doing that. So, as you can tell, this is um, reading the Bible is better than most sermons. So, let's uh, turn now. So, so you have. So, let me explain the scene then. First, you have the opening scene where John is called up into heaven, and we're presented generally with the scene of the inside of the temple that's in heaven. That's that's section 1 here. And that's verses 1 through 4. And you see various things, right? The throne, the elders. Then you have a really a focus upon the throne and a description of the things that are around the throne, what it looks like. And remember, Throughout this text, similes are used. I saw something like that kind of wording. And that's important. Um, One commentator wrote this, and I thought it was very, very helpful. We may be confused by the blend of resemblance and variation between John's visions and those of his Old Testament predecessors in prophecy. But the prophetic vocabulary of simile should lead us to expect fluidity. Prophetic vision is not intended to provide photographic reproduction of what spirits such as cherubim and seraphim look like. That's not the point. The, 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 the point of these images is not so that you could get a tattoo. Right? And I'm not doing like a thing against tattoos. I'm just saying we're, we're not giving, we're not given like these crisp, no. It's similes. Prophetic vision is not intended to provide photographic reproduction of what spirits such as cherubim and seraphim look like. Rather, in prophetic vision, God adapts to the need of the moment the visual metaphors by which he portrays aspects of truth about himself and his heavenly courtiers. So God is revealing or he is showing to John in this vision and then as we'll see to the prophets, various aspects and different truths regarding that that heavenly realm. That heavenly realm. Another commentator put it really succinctly. He said, a vision, revelation... Um, 4, 5, and 6, is a vision that symbolizes, not a photograph that realizes. A vision that symbolizes, not a photograph that realizes. And that's something that we have to remember. So, um, the structure of the text. So, verses 1 through 4. We get a general picture of the temple. Verses 5 through 7. Verses 5 through 7. We get a specific look at the throne. Images emanating from and around the throne. Beginning at verse 8, we have the worship of the Creator. That's 8 through the end of the chapter. So chapter 4 really is broken into three parts. Verses 1 through 4, verses 5 through 7, verses 8 through 11. And then chapter 5 opens with a book. And that is verses 1 through 5. Verses 6 through 9, the Lamb. The Lamb. Excuse me, 6 through 8 is the Lamb. 
6 through 8 is the Lamb. 9 through 10 is the new song. 9 through 10 is the new song. And then 11 to the end of the chapter, 11 through 14 is worship of the Lamb. 11 through 14. So that's the general structure of the chapter. And you have the throne room, God the Father, the Spirit is there, there are angels there, there are other heavenly beings. And then into that throne room enters the Lamb. And then the Lamb receives blessing, honor, glory, dominion forever and ever. Now, does that, reading that, does that bring to mind any Old Testament text? Is there any Old Testament text that comes to mind? Daniel, Daniel 7. Really, Revelation chapters 4 and 5 are a commentary on Daniel 7. Let's turn to Daniel 7. In Daniel chapter 7, this is the benefit of having worked through Daniel corporately and then working through the book of Revelation. You have the background. But we'll review it again this evening to help clarify these things. And then as we work slowly through chapters 4 and 5, we'll see this in greater detail. Daniel chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up. You see, right? The same same imagery that John sees, you have thrones being set up in heaven. And then, in particular now, he focuses upon the Ancient of Days. He took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. What figures of speech is he using? Similes. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. In Revelation chapter 4, you have the sea of glass. In Exodus, when the elders eat, they ascend the temple, the, the mountain, and they eat with God. There is a platform of sapphire that they eat on. Well, all of these are, it's not, they're not different locations. This is what the prophets are seeing, and the visions are overwhelming. Remember, God is a spirit. He doesn't have a body like we do. God lives in unapproachable light. Even in heaven, or in the new heavens and the new earth, you're not going to walk up to God and shake his hand. He is a spirit. He will continue to be one. But what these texts are revealing, or helping us understand, is some aspect of the heavenly reality. Verse 10, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him. Did we hear that already in Revelation? And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court, was, the court sat and the books were open. And we have a book, books here and a book in Revelation. Now, look at verse 13. So, so you have a, a, a glimpse. You're given a glimpse in 
Daniel chapter 7 of the throne room of God, that courtroom inside the temple. You get a picture, not a picture, right? A symbol. But it's hard to shake the vocabulary, right? You get this, this symbolism, a representation, a prophetic representation of this heavenly courtroom. Now look at verse 13. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night vision, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one, like a son of man, was coming, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. So, is the Son of Man in heaven with God, or is he coming into heaven to God. He's coming to heaven on clouds. What does that sound like? Luke 24 and the Ascension, Acts chapter 1. This is, this is, uh, um, we can't, uh, we have to be careful about strict chronology. But in essence, what is being communicated is that this is when the Son of Man enters into heaven. And of course, this would be at the resurrection. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And what we see in the book of Revelation is that the Son of Man, the heavenly Son of Man, this divine being, is the Son of David, is the slain Lamb. And all of that symbolism is brought together in one person. Uh, the uh, first chapter of the book we're reading for, for, um, for groups covers a similar point very helpfully. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the people that that excuse me that all the peoples nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. And Revelation really unpacks and expands what this means. In essence, remember, at, after the resurrection, Jesus says, Matthew chapter 28, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Therefore, right, go into all nations. Okay, so, so, so that, that's the structure. And here in Daniel, you have Revelation 4 and 5 depicted in this particular way. Now, there are some other places that are, that are important for some of the imagery that we'll see in the book of Revelation. That The imagery that we're given is not alien to the Bible. It's not the first time that many of the things that we see in Revelation appear in the Bible. So let's briefly take a look at Isaiah 6. And in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah the prophet is called into, in, into the ministry, as it were. He's called to be a prophet. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. And now, John tells us that this is Jesus. Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. But we have the same throne room. And remember, in Revelation, God and the Lamb are both on the throne. So there's no difficulty here with this being a pre-incarnate Revelation or theophany of Christ. His robe filled the temple. 
seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. So the, the, that's why I call that um, when John is called up into heaven, Revelation chapter 5, that's why I called it a temple. Because that's where these things take place. There is a heavenly temple. A heavenly temple. And in Exodus chapter 25, we're going to... So, so that's the, the text of Isaiah. Now, I'm picking up here off, off of this uh, temple, right, the temple here. And I want to show you something in Exodus that's important. In Exodus chapter 25. In Exodus chapter 25 and verse 10. Look, look back at uh, verse 8. Exodus chapter 25 verse 8. Let them construct a sanctuary for me. Now, this is God commanding the people of Israel. This is before, right, chronologically, in the history of Israel, before the vision of Isaiah. Isaiah enters into a heavenly temple. But here, let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them. The, the sanctuary, the dwelling place of God is God's temple. That's what's being talked about here. According to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of its furniture, just so you shall construct it. The fact that there's a pattern, right? They're going to be given a particular pattern that they're going to base, an, uh, that they're going to build the earthly representation of this pattern. One more text. Hebrews 8.5. And this is along the same line. Hebrews 8.5. Hebrews chapter 8. Verse Five. I'm going to read from uh, oh, chapter seven. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter eight, now verse. I'm going to start at verse four. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve. A copy, a pattern, and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle. For see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. There's a temple in heaven. And the sanctuary on earth is modeled after that pattern. Okay. So, what Isaiah sees, although in symbolic image, in that uh, spiritual realm that Isaiah enters and that John enters, that's the real thing. That's the reality. The, the physical temple in Jerusalem... Or, or even the tabernacle, those were just patterns. And they were modeled after the heavenly reality where God dwells. Where God dwells. Okay. Now, 
We're almost at time. I, I want to look at one more text then. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel chapter 1, and this is going to touch upon the, the angelic beings in particular. The angelic beings. And in Ezekiel chapter 1, Verse 4. As I looked, behold, the storm wind was coming from the north. A great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and bright light around it. And remember, the, the spirit would lead the people in a glory cloud in the Old Testament. And then you have flashes of lightning, this uh, peals of thunder, brightness flashing, very similar to what John sees. Within it were, verse 5, were figures resembling four living beings. And this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calves' hooves, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides were human hands. As for the face and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved, each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of a bull on the left. And all four had the face of an eagle. And remember, there's a separation or a distinction in the four flying angelic beings in Revelation. One looks like a lion. One looks like a calf. One looks like an eagle. One looks like a human. Such were their faces, verse 11. Their wings were spread out above, and each had two touching other, excuse me, two touching another being and two covering their bodies. And each went straight forward wherever the spirit was about to go. They would go without turning as they went. I'll read one more text. In Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel chapter, and you can read the rest of Ezekiel chapter 1. And if it's the first time you you're, you uh, read it, you'll be confused. But then you go back and you read it a couple more times and outline it, and you won't be as confused. The vision of God's glory now departing the earthly temple is what we have here. Verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, in the expanse that was over the heads of the cherubim, and now we have these angelic beings they're given a, a name a cherubim something like a sapphire stone in appearance resembling a throne appeared above them right and remember it was like fire in isaiah it's a sea of glass in revelation it's a foundation this same terminology is used in um exodus when the elders ascend up the mountain with Moses. And he spoke to the man clothed in linen and said, Enter between the whirl, the whirling wheels under the cherubim and fill your hands with the coals of fire from between the cherubim and scatter them over the city. And the same kind of imagery is taken up in Isaiah. So, um... What's the application? How do I apply this sermon? This wasn't even a sermon. We just read a bunch of passages together. The, the Word of God interprets the Word of God. And so take heart. As we read or as we uh, preach through and interpret the book of Revelation, there are places in the Bible that you can go to. Like, you don't have to go to tomahawk helicopters. You don't have to go to, like... You know what I'm saying? Like the chip on your card is the mark of the beast and the bark. That's, you don't have to go there. The, the Bible helps you interpret the Bible, right? So take heart. 
The Lord does not want to confuse us. There is enough material in the Bible to help us uh, to help us interpret obscure and unclear texts. Okay, and uh, I think next week we have our next week we preach yeah, or meeting M- membership matters. So the following week then is baptism. No, the following week then the twenty second we come back and we'll get into. Uh, chapter 4 proper. Let's uh, pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to gather together. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to meditate upon the passages that were, help us to meditate upon the passages that uh, were referred to this evening. Help us to read over Revelation 4 and 5 so that we may have a grasp upon the text. Uh, So that when it's preached, Lord, there might be understanding. Again, Lord, I pray that you would bless this study. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.